Okay, so continuing our discussion of liabilities, we've talked about some of the common current liabilities. We've talked about uh, payroll liabilities and fringe benefits, vacations, etc. Um, so let's talk a little bit about installment notes. You know, sometimes in business, uh, it's okay to take on debt, particularly of a long-term nature. And so uh, just as when you go out and you buy a car and you finance it for, say, five years, that's a type of installment note where you're making the same payment every month. Uh, businesses have the same thing. And so when we talk about uh, installment notes, it says that an installment note is a debt that requires the borrower, in our case that would be a, some type of a business, to make equal periodic payments to uh, the lender uh, for the term of the note. And so when we talk about installment notes, we want to understand that this equal periodic payment is broken down into a couple of parts. And the first part says the payment of a portion of the amount initially owed uh, is going to be called the principal. So if we borrow $20,000, uh, we're ultimately going to have to pay $20,000 back in principal. But in addition to that uh, principal amount, we're also going to have to pay some interest. So this Again, this equal periodic payment that we're going to make, say every month, for example, uh, whatever our, that payment is, whether it's $10,000 or $400, a portion of that is going to be interest, and a portion is going to go towards the principal of the note. Okay, At the end of the note's term, the principal will, be have, uh, will have been repaid in full. So we borrowed $20,000. Uh, whether we borrowed it for five years, 10 years, uh, at the end of that period of time, we may have paid far more than $20,000 in payments, but we would have uh, repaid the $20,000 principal. So we have an example here uh, when we're talking about the issuance of an installment note. It says, assume that on January the, one, uh, January the 1st, Lewis Company issues the following installment note to the City National Bank. They're going to borrow $24,000 and they're going to do so at 6% interest. The term of the note is five years and the annual payments total $5,698. So uh, the math behind that has been done for us and so we just know that our total payments are going to be $5,698. So we have here a journal entry where we receive the cash in the amount of $24,000 and we're going to credit notes payable for the liability $24,000. This will be uh, an example of an interest-bearing installment note. In other words, we, the, we owe $24,000 and we got $24,000 and then we're going to pay the interest on top of the $24,000. So that's an interest-bearing uh, installment note. And what we have here um, is basically uh, an amortization schedule. However, an amortization schedule is usually going to be viewed from the perspective uh, of the lender because a loan is actually an, an example of an intangible asset. And so it has to be, uh, the value of that asset has to be amortized. But here what we are seeing is a little bit different. Uh, we're looking at this really from the perspective, truly we're looking at this from the perspective of the uh, borrower. So January 1 of year 1, we borrowed $24,000. Over the course of the year, we paid $5,698 in uh, monthly payments. We'll just pretend that they're monthly payments. We don't really know. But the, how do we figure out how much of that $5,698 is interest and how much should go to principal? Well, it's very simple. We just merely take the interest rate stated as 6%, and for the first year, we multiply it by the amount of the note, the principal amount of $24,000. If we multiply... Um, if we were to multiply uh, our um, 
six percent point zero six times twenty four thousand we're going to get the 1440 that they show us here okay um so what that means is is that of this 5698 1440 dollars is interest expense and four thousand two hundred fifty eight dollars is the decrease in principal so let's just bring our, our uh, calculator back over here for just a moment it says that at the end of year one as december 31st our carrying amount is 19 thousand seven hundred and forty two where do we how did we get there well we started off owing twenty four thousand um but if we if we paid off principal of forty two fifty eight at the end of the year we would owe then nineteen uh seven forty two okay and you can see the carrying amount goes gradually down until we finish paying off the note uh in year five we're going to look at amortization schedules a lot more when we get into our discussion of uh, bonds in the next chapter but this is an example of an amortization schedule for a uh, installment note long-term installment note so uh, now the way they've done this here is a little bit differently than what I explained on the previous slide generally speaking you're going to make um, a payment every month although that's not that doesn't have to be that way there could be a payment that's made uh, once a year so what we have here is it says the entry to record the first payment on December the 31st so they're telling us that it's actually uh, one payment a year is we know that cash is going out of 5698 and we know that the cash is an asset and that assets are decreased with a credit so it makes sense that we would uh, credit cash for fifty six ninety eight, and then we're going to have two debits. We're going to reduce the liability notes payable by the principal portion forty two fifty eight, and then our interest expense is going to go directly over uh, to the other income and expense uh, section of the income statement, <clears throat> and is going to have a negative impact on net income. In this case, to the tune of one thousand four hundred forty dollars. Okay, so that was installment notes. We also need to understand that in business we have, um, in addition to liabilities that we know are going to occur, we also have what are called contingent liabilities. So let's see what it says here. It says that some liabilities uh, may arise from past transactions. We're going to look at a really uh, good example of that here in a moment. Only if certain events uh, occur in the future. And it says these potential obligations are called contingent liabilities. And it says that when we are accounting for contingent liabilities or how we do that depends on a couple of factors. Number one is the likelihood of occurrence. How likely uh, is an event to occur based on a previous action? And then also, how do we measure? Measure what? Well, measure the amount of the liability. So let's get into that. Uh, the first thing that we're going to look at are contingent liabilities that are probable, meaning likely to happen, and estimable, meaning we can estimate how much uh, we're going to owe. So this example here is a very, very basic, um, very, very common type of contingent liability it says to illustrate assuming that during june a company sold a product for sixty thousand um, dollars and i think for our purposes it would help if we clarify here this sixty thousand dollars is made up of multiple sales maybe these items are fifty dollars a piece seventy five dollars a piece something like that uh, and these include a 36-month warranty for repairs. Says the average cost of repairs over the warranty period is 5% of the sales price. So, very, very important distinction here to make. 
Um, let's look at the, let's just look at the rest of this, and then I want to I want to cover this a little bit more. It says the entry to record the estimated product warranty expense for June is as follows. Product warranty expense is debited for three thousand, and we're going to set up a liability product warranty payable for three thousand. So, I want you to understand that what we're saying is that overall at some point over the next three years these products that we sold in june of the current year for sixty thousand are going to incur uh estimated warranty expense of five percent of sales five percent of sixty thousand again is three thousand we have that here in the journal entry explanation so we're going to uh we're going to make that entry immediately okay so don't get confused if you get a question that says um you know we sold sixty thousand dollars worth of merchandise and we estimate that we're going to have to um uh, pay back five percent of that uh via warranty repairs or replacement and then I and then I give you additional information that uh, you know two thousand five hundred dollars of, of 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 merchandise was returned, or I tell you that four percent was returned, and I ask you to make the journal entry. Well, what actually happens over the next month is irrelevant, um, because part of those returns would have been from from prior months. Okay, so don't overcomplicate it. Keep it very very simple when it comes to warranty. Uh, product warranty expense. Uh, we take it month by month. We have sales of 60000 We estimate 5% product warranty expense. We multiply that by the 60000 In this case, we come up with 3000 And that's the end of it. Okay, for our purposes, that's the end of it. And then we set up the corresponding liability for the same amount. All right? Now, now, As we go on, assume that uh, as part of those product sales, assume that a $200 part is replaced under that warranty on August the 16th. The entry to record replacement of the defective part is as follows. We're going to reduce that product warranty payable for $200. I want you to understand the product warranty payable does not necessarily have a three thousand dollar balance in it because we're we're uh, increasing that and we're decreasing it every month. So this is just the journal entry here for any two hundred dollar uh, uh, warranty repair that we might make. We're going to reduce the overall product warranty li uh, uh, liability payable account by two hundred dollars with a credit. And then in this case, it looks like uh, they were able to use supplies, um, just basically parts um, that I guess there was no labor involved or anything in, in getting those in there. Um, in any event, um, supplies, which is an asset, has been credited for $200. This credit is not the most important part here. Uh, the part that's important is that when we when we replace that as part of our uh, estimated uh, warranty repairs, the warranty uh, amount does in fact decrease with a debit. So we get looked at some journal entries and some examples of probable and estimable, estimable um, expenses. But what if we know that the event is likely to happen, but we can't really estimate the amount of the liability. So it says here a contingent liability whose occurrence is probable, however not estimable, is disclosed in the notes to the financial statements. So again, don't be confused. Don't be confused. If you have a situation where um, the liability exists but you're unable to estimate it, what we're going to do, that's not going to appear on the balance sheet, the statement of financial position, whatever you want to call it, that's going to be uh, disclosed in the notes to the financial statements. 
we can't put it in the we can't put it on the balance sheet because if we do we have no justification for whatever amount that we would record that liability okay so we can't put it directly on the balance sheet for that reason however we do need to put it in the notes so that our financial statements and the related notes are still uh, fairly stated to potential investors and outside parties. This is a wonderful little uh, diagram here. It says uh, we've, we've got um, these likelihood of occurring. We've got three categories. We've got probable, reasonably possible, and then remote. Uh, so when we're talking about reasonably possible liability, it says a contingent liability whose occurrence is reasonably possible is disclosed in the notes to the financial statements. So let's just look at this really quickly. We've got some, uh, we've got our contingent liability right here. We're going to break that down into the likelihood of occurrence. We've talked about these three. I think we have one more slide on remote uh, contingencies. So really. Um, all we have to worry about here is if the likelihood of occurrence is probable and we're able to estimate the liability, at that point we're going to record the liability on the balance sheet and disclose the liability. If, it's, if the liability is probable but we cannot estimate it, we merely disclose it in the notes and also uh, notice that if the liability is reasonably possible, we're going to disclose it in the notes, but under no circumstances would we actually record uh, a liability. And then uh, finally, if the contingency has a remote possibility of occurrence, we do nothing. Okay. And that's what this slide right here says. Uh, we don't have to really do anything if the possibility uh, of uh, liability is remote. Okay, and then we have that same uh, slide uh, a second time under accounting treatment uh, for contingent liabilities. And then finally, um, where do we put all this stuff? Hopefully by now you understand that all liabilities are a part of the balance sheet. We have two types of liabilities. We have current liabilities. That's what we'll deal with uh, mostly. I do want to make one note here. Interest uh, payable is not generally found on the face of the balance sheet. Um, it's out there, uh, but we don't really put it here. So this is a bit odd. Um, and then, of course, we also have our long-term liabilities. Uh, most of our examples, there won't be a, a ton under long-term liabilities, but do understand that for larger companies uh, with complex, uh, complex business transactions, this long-term liabilities section is actually um, got a lot of stuff, a uh, lot of stuff there, more than just uh, one heading for uh, notes payable, for example. All right, let's wrap this uh, chapter up.